Open your Bibles, if you will, to Job chapter 14. Job 14. That's in the Old Testament, right after the book of Job chapter 13. Job 14, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 7. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. <clears throat> Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hand. I'll stop right there. Lee Strobel was a Chicago newspaper reporter and a, an open and avowed atheist before giving his life to Jesus Christ. And he's become well known for his investigative journalism style of books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for the Resurrection, the, the, or the, rather The Case for Easter on the Resurrection, The Case for Creation, and others. In The Case for Christ, which I read, he interviewed J.P. Moreland, who is, the, who is a professor of philosophy at Talbot Theological Seminary. That title sounds real impressive, doesn't it? Biola University in La Mirada, California. Biola is an acronym. It stood for the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. It hasn't been a Bible Institute in nearly 60 years. And even the, the expression Bible Institute would be an embarrassment to them today. Now it's a liberal arts university. Let me say, if, if your supposed uh, Christian school has a philosophy department. It's not a Christian school, nor is it a Bible teaching school. My dad graduated from one of the last classes of the Bible Institute many years ago, and they went off in a different direction not long after that, but I'm glad God gave him what he needed to give him when he was there. I'm proud to say I'm a graduate of Pensacola Bible Institute. Hey, uh and that the, one of the um, most um, well-versed and intelligent men in the Word of God taught me. Amen. I'm proud to say that I was taught by Peter S. Ruckman. Amen. But in that interview, Strobel and Moreland both concluded that the subject of a literal burning hell uh, can't be taken literally. It's all figurative language, they agreed. Both men might be saved, but neither one is a Bible believer. The only case Strobel made in that part of the book was a case for the Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe in hell either. No question has plagued mankind like the one Job asked centuries ago in verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? We believe the Bible. We believe that these are the words of God given to us by, for our hope for our comfort, and for our instruction. And we try to take it as literally as we can, wherever we can. King David told the Lord 3,000 years ago, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm 17, verse 15. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul confessed, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. You're hoping for something that's never going to come to pass. What a loser you are. A true believer in Jesus Christ hopes to be made like him one day and then to spend eternity in perfect joy with him forever. So it's a fair question to ask. How do you know there is any life after death? good or bad. And so I call this sermon outline, The Case for Eternity. The Case for Eternity. And this won't be a long sermon. 
None of mine are very long. I believe if I can say what I think ought to be said and get to the point and not torture you with it for the next, you know, for an hour and a half, then I've done what God wants me to do. But point number one, consider the testimony from science. The testimony from science. The first law of thermodynamics says that uh, matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can, be, you can convert it from one form into another form, but you can't uh, completely obliterate matter or energy. If we burn a piece of wood, we simply change it from a solid uh, form into a gaseous form, which then goes into the atmosphere and leaves ashes behind. But the total substance, uh, the total uh, substance of the matter uh, remains the same in some different form. And the Bible actually expresses this law when it says that God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and then God rested from all his work which he had made, Genesis 2, verses 1 and 2. He stopped creating anything new. The New Testament reveals that in Christ, God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. So he's also credited with the creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Colossians 1.16. And right now he's said to be upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1 verse 3. He's not creating anything brand new either. And he's holding it together by his power. The idea that the human soul would be totally extinguished at death is not in keeping with known scientific principles. That's why I say the testimony from science. If man ceased to exist completely, he would be the only thing in the universe that did so. So there's the very strong probability that you are going to exist and live somewhere after this body dies. Secondly, I want you to consider the testimony from nature, what we call God's creation. Job makes a reference to it in our text in verses 7 to 9. Let me read those again. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. We had two liquid amber trees in the front of our yard near the public sidewalk, the kind with the, you know, the little sticker balls. And one of them had pushed up the public sidewalk quite a bit and cracked the driveway. And the city, because the public sidewalk offered to come by, chop the tree down, grind the stump, and repair the sidewalk, which we said, fine, come ahead and do that. So we have one tree now. And in the backyard, it was unlandscaped. There was nothing there but dirt and dust and weeds and so forth. We had that fixed eventually and planted new grass and a sprinkler system. And we began to water the, the grass seed and the lawn began to come in. And through the scent of water, that tree in the front and the roots under the ground, that sent a root all the way under our house, which sprang up in the backyard, and it came up, and I could tell by the leaves on that which tree it had come from, because none of the neighbors near us have trees like those. Just as Job had said, and it came up as a little plant, not a tree. So I chopped it down too. <laughs> That's what you got to do with those kinds of things. But Job knew about it 4,000 years ago. That's a marvelous thing of the Word of God. A tree that is cut down, uh, it seems to be gone. It might not be gone at all. It's waiting to live again. A forest fire can burn down thousands of acres until the, the landscape looks like the surface of the moon. But a dead pine cone will eject the seeds that are in it when it's exposed to great heat. And in each one of those seeds is the DNA for a brand new tree to start growing and eventually a new forest in time. 
King Tutankhamun, uh, King Tut, died in Egypt in 1339 BC. And his grave was undisturbed until 1922 when a British archaeologist named Howard Carter discovered it. And since then, of course, his remains and artifacts and so forth have been on display in exhibits uh, around the world. But along with the furniture and the weapons and other things in his tomb, the sarcophagus, etc., were also found clay jars containing grains and seeds and precious oils. After being effectively dead for 3,200 years, scientists took some of those seeds and they introduced them to fresh soil and fresh water. And you know what happened? They started to grow. They started to grow. Something that seems to be dead may not be dead at all. It's waiting to live. The Bible talks about these bodies as that thing we plant in the ground that a new one might come forth. Thirdly, today, I want you to consider the testimony of desire. The testimony of desire. There's a universal longing in the hearts of men to live forever. How do you fully account for that? Of all the animals in nature, man seems to be the only one who wants to keep living. Other animals or, or creatures are satisfied to sleep, to bear young, to eat every day, and not much more than that. But man's never satisfied, no matter how much he achieves, no matter how much education, no matter how much wealth, no matter how much fame and popularity he might uh, attain to in this world, he always wants more. And men have been very creative in their efforts to live forever. And let me say these things. Most, not all, but most of the great achievements in art and architecture and music and drama and painting and literature and engineering and math and science and medicine have been brought to the world by the efforts of men not women. Sorry about this, ladies, but it's, it's, statistically it's true. Most of the famous developers, uh, chemists of women's perfumes, are men. I guess men know what they want to smell on a woman, right? <laughs> so we, we know. <laughs> and some of the most famous women's clothing and dress designers have been men. Like I said, not all. There are always the exceptions, but the general rule is nevertheless true. Things we think of, and the, some of the world's greatest chefs, uh, likewise, have been men. Things that we think of as the, the, the strong suits of, of women have nevertheless been dominated by men. Women are able to do something that men cannot do. Women are the bearers of new life. They can bring forth another living person into the world. A woman has two, three, four children. She's replaced herself four times. And from them come grandchildren, great-grandchildren in time. Men are trying to create life. That's what it comes down to. They're trying to create something that will outlive them, that will carry their name and their legacy into the future. They don't want their reputations, they don't want their names to disappear and be completely forgotten. They want to live in some form or another. Man seems to be the only creature in all the universe who strives for immortality. Verse 14 expresses this desire. Let's read verse 14 again. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Wherever men have traveled throughout the world, they find certain instinctive beliefs. Everywhere there is some kind of uh, the belief in some kind of God or some higher deity or being than themselves. Everywhere there is the belief in uh, good and bad, right and wrong, cause and effect. One thing is going to lead to another if you're not careful with it. 
And everywhere there is the belief in life after death. There never was a society or a culture found that didn't believe some of these things, that didn't believe in some future life. Think of it, the, 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 what we call the happy hunting grounds of the American Indians, the halls of Valhalla, the Viking warriors would be found in, or some sensual, erotic uh, paradise for Muslim terrorists with 70 virgins and so forth. And uh, every society, every culture, now those ideas have been around and have existed for thousands of years in about every walk of life, every religion, the Chinese, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Hindus, and others, they all believed in the real possibility, or rather in the possibility of life after death. But none of those things, none of those hopes had any real possibility until the coming and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. On Easter, and we don't like that word, we talk about the resurrection, but for lack of a better word, we'll just use that word. We remind ourselves that Christ rose from the dead. And if someone is trusting in him, that person hopes to rise from the dead too. John 6, verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Christ said, In my Father's house are many mansions. John 14, verse 2. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1, 18. And because I live, ye shall live also. The fact of Christ's resurrection and his influence on the world since it happened is a strong support for our belief in eternity and our belief in life after death. If a man is an atheist, I mean a true enough, sure enough atheist, he believes there's no God now, there never has been a God, and there never will be a God in the future. He also denies the existence of the soul of man. He thinks the only things that uh, truly exist are physical, visible matter that can be studied by the various sciences. He's known as a materialist. That's what the term materialist refers to. Dr. Mario Beauregard is at the University of Arizona. And he wrote a fascinating book several years ago called the Spiritual Brain, subtitle, A Neuroscientist's Case for the Existence of the Soul. He's not a believer, doesn't profess to be a believer in Jesus Christ, but he's a medical researcher. And he said on page 114 of that book, within each neuron, those are the brain cells which transmit information back and forth, the molecules are replaced approximately 10,000 times in an average lifespan. Yet humans have a continuous sense of self that is stable over time. In other words, the physical cells may replace themselves, but your memories don't disappear. They remain constant. Explain that, if you will. He writes about the placebo effect. You give someone a, nothing more than a sugar pill some suffering patient and tell them that this is a very strong medicine and it will relieve the symptoms they're having. And if that patient believes it enough, the benefits will come, but they don't come from the pill. Something inside of them causes those effects to take place. Those things shouldn't happen if all you are is physical matter and there's nothing spiritual about you. Dr. Beauregard writes about Near-death experiences, they're called NDEs, or out-of-body experiences, which have been documented for a long time now. A patient was clinically dead in surgery, no heartbeat, no brain waves could be detected, and yet later they were able to recall what was discussed in the operating room, uh, what conversations were taking place between the nurses and the doctor, as if they were 
outside their body in another from another vantage point beholding uh, appearing to uh, see everything taking place below them so even in our modern times People are still fascinated, still trying to, to, to answer Job's question, if a man die, shall he live again? Edward Gibbon was a historian who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. He was also a skeptic, an unbeliever in Jesus Christ. And on his dying bed, he said these words, This day may be my last. I will agree that the immortality of the soul is at times a very comfortable doctrine. All this is now lost, finally irrevocably lost. All is dark and doubtful. He died 1794. In that same era, there was another man, a Christian hymn writer named Augustus Toplady. He wrote, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. On his dying bed in 1778, he said this, Oh, what delights! Who can fathom the joy of the third heaven? The sky is clear. There is no cloud. All is light. All is light. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. There's quite a difference between someone who knew Jesus Christ and someone who didn't know him, or someone who was only pretending to know him. A lot of pretenders in the world today. Dr. Rawlings was a cardiologist in Tennessee. And he wrote about his experiences. He had a patient experience a heart attack while he was performing a, a treadmill stress test in his office. And uh, he and his nurses performed CPR quickly to resuscitate this man. And uh, they would resuscitate this man. This went on several times during the course of a few minutes, and he would die, uh, no, no uh, heart activity, and they'd resuscitate him again. He'd come back. Every time he'd come back saying, I'm in hell. I'm in hell. Don't let me go. I'm in hell. And eventually, he asked Dr. Rawlings to pray with him, and Rawlings admitted later he was never uh, spiritually minded. He was a man of medicine. But to pacify the man, to satisfy the man's request, he led him in a prayer to Jesus. Such, such like, if you let me live, I'll be yours forever. And Dr. Rawlings said, almost immediately, the man's heart rate returned to normal. No more screaming. Um, no more panic. And it later led Dr. Rawlings to become a true believer in Jesus Christ himself. He died in 2010, but he spent the rest of his uh, life documenting these near-death experiences. You know, you've heard the stories of someone who said they saw a white light and heard beautiful music and uh, joy and peace and love coming towards them. But Dr. Rawlings, in his investigation, said there are just as many stories of people who said they were heading for judgment, they were heading for fire, they were heading for hell, as there are with the positive ones. It's just that the negative ones don't get as much play in the news media. My dad talks about his father, my grandpa Shribe, who died in February of 1961. I never had a chance to meet him. But told my grandma, I hear angels singing. And Jesus is calling my name. He's ready to go. He was ready to be with Jesus Christ. Now, someone who doesn't believe in life after death They can reject the points I've tried to make. They can say, all oh, that's just anecdotal coincidence. And how do you know any of that's true? But I will conclude with this question. The question, based on what I've tried to give today, um, 
is not if you will spend eternity somewhere, but where will you spend eternity? That's the question. Heaven or hell? If the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he offers to raise those who are trusting in him, you'd be a fool not to. Hell is not some party place where you're going to have nothing but good times. If the Lord Jesus' story was true about Lazarus and the rich man, he said that in hell, uh, the, Lazarus, uh, the rich man lift up his eyes being in torments. The Bible says, 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, and I'll close right here. This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Do you have him? Amen. Do you know that you're saved? Amen. I know that I'm saved, and I have every expectation that when this life is over, I'll wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ Amen. and live with him for eternity. By the way, I'm already scheduled to live with him for eternity because I'm already saved. I'm not waiting to get saved. I'm saved now. I just want this body to get caught up with it one day.